to uh, have this session about the geopolitics of the Gulf uh, in the fifth Middle East Congress of Politics and Society. We are going to speak about the geopolitics of the region, very important region. Geopolitics is very important for uh, evaluating the uh, process that is going on there in the Qatar crisis and other issues related to the Gulf area. Uh, geopolitics means that not only geography or, pol or policies or politics, but also history, religion, sectarianism uh, in this very vivid uh, region in the uh, Arab world. So we are very pleased to uh, start this session uh, with our distinguished guests. Uh, first of all, we are going to st start with Dr. Irhan uh, Akash, uh, visiting research fellow in Durhan University who uh, is going to speak up about the pursuit of economic security in Qatar after the uh, Gulf crisis. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Irhan, uh, proceed. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. And I also thank the Ormer Conference team for providing me this uh, opportunity to present my paper here. Today, I will present about the economic reactions of Qatar against the blockade imposed by their neighbors like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, as well as Egypt and some small African countries. As we all know that these countries are rentier economies, so their economies are not diversified, although they have many economic policies to transform their natural resources-based economy to an alternative economic system. <clears throat> Therefore, they have not sufficient economies in terms of domestic needs. This being the case, Qatar faced many problems when they were imposed sanctions such as closing of their borders, air and sea bases, as well as diplomatic sanctions. Well, I will follow this outline to clarify the Qatar's economic condition in this crisis. After giving my main, main focus on an argument of the paper, I will mention about the general background of the Gulf crisis, then I will jump to what happened in the early stage of the blockade from the perspective of Qatar. After giving this picture, I will state what Qatar did to bypass this process with a minimum damage in terms of domestic needs and financial loss. <clears throat> as for focus and argument of the paper, as I mentioned, this presentation will focus on the economic reactions of Qatar against the blockade. And this paper argues that Qatar have eliminated these problems afterwards through their new trade partners and sovereign wealth funds, although they had many problems in the early stage of the blockade. When we look at the crisis, firstly, I want to mention it is conceptual perception, whether it is Qatar crisis or Gulf crisis. I personally prefer to use Gulf crisis rather than calling it as Qatar uh, crisis because it is a regional crisis despite of imposing the Qatar. However, mainly blockading countries call as Qatar crisis to show Qatar as a source of problem. That's the, that's very important point, by the way. All we all know, this crisis erupted on the 5th of June, 2017. It was just in the middle of the Ramadan when the people socialized more with their relatives and friends. What happened just at the beginning of the crisis in general? Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt, they all declared air, land, and sea embargo on Qatar with closing it is on the land border to Saudi Arabia. Afterward, blockade countries announced a list of 13 demands. These demands mainly are to curb diplomatic ties with Iran, to severe all ties to terrorist organizations, to shut down Al Jazeera, and to terminate the Turkish military base, and so on. How was the picture in Qatar during the early stage of the blockade? In here, this picture, the people in Qatar attacked to supermarkets with the embargo, 
Therefore, all daily products were run out in a short time. The problem is that in that time, Qatar used to import their daily products from Saudi Arabia. In this case, Qatar's main supply flows to their border, which is the only land border. So, this situation is the first shock of the blockade. Second shock of the blockade was on the financial sector. The gold prices has a negative impact on the financial sector because the blockade was unforeseen and happened suddenly. Hence, the Qatar Stock Exchange underwent its most significant price drop in 18 months. It was nearly 80% after the diplomatic drift on Monday. This resulted in Qatar's uh, sovereign credit rating being downgraded by Standard & Poor's Global Ratings. On 17th of June in 2017, from AA negative to AA as a reflection of the blockade. This followed by the Fitch ratings by downgrading to AA negative as a negative outlook. In addition to stock exchange and credit ratings, the Qatar real depreciated from the back exchange rate level of 3.64 against the US dollar to 3.76, which is the lowest level since 2001, when currency back has been implemented. Regarding the Qatari financial system, the scale of the impact was crucial as the first two months of the blockade. During that time, 23 billion US dollar was withdrawn from the Qatari banks these capital outflows increased to around 35 billion US dollars in the first six months of the blockade, which, is the, which led to dropping 21 billion US dollars in official foreign exchange reserves. As an early stage scenario of the blockade, lastly, I want to present the impact of the blockade on the airline route. This picture, which was taken by me from a trip of mine to Doha. As you can see, Qatar Airways used longer route after Muscat all around to the UAE rather than flying over the UAE as a result of the blockade. This new route, route is a bit costly for the airline companies. And I can say that it is also time wasting for the passengers. After giving the Qatar's position during the early stage of the blockade. First, I want to present a figure about Qatar's trade with blockade countries and new selected trade partners for the period of 2013 and 2018, just one year beyond the blockade. Before explaining the figure, I should say that the collecting data for rentier states like Qatar, it is quite challenging due to the lack of detailed data. However, like I found this data from International Trade Center. As for new trade partners, Uman provides the most remarkable route during the blockade for Qatar, hence they have developed their trade and business relationship. According to figure, Uman's export to Qatar was around 970 million US dollar in 2018, while it was 400 million US dollar in 2013. This change was around 140% in 2017. It is a huge change, by the way. Another trading partner of Qatar from Gulf region during the block blockade is Kuwait. Their export to Qatar were around 230 million US dollar in 2008, and the annual change was 20% when compared to 2017. However, this change was 104% immediately after the blockade. This result showed that Uman and Kuwait supported Qatar in the early stage of the blockade by exporting crucial goods in 2017. Although total export from Uman and Kuwait to Qatar increased in 2017, annual change declined in uh, 2018, as you can see in the figure as well. According to trade volume in 2008, 
it's possible to state that Qatar has found new trade partners from out of Gulf region for long term and focus on the local production after the early stage of the blockade to meet their needs for the long term. As far out of the GCC countries, according to figure, Iran is the most remarkable country as a new trade link for Qatar during the blockade. Iran's export to Qatar were around 250 million US dollars in 2018, and the increase was about 140% when it's compared to the previous year. However, Iran's export to Qatar declined to 225 million US dollars in 2008 because Qatar started to produce farm products and their products domest domestically. Secondly, the export of India, where is providing an alternative route to the blockading countries for Qatar was around 1.2 billion US dollar in 2017. Therefore, the annual change was about 54% in 2017 compared to 2016. This volume was uh, 1.7 billion US dollar without with about 42% uh, annual change in 2018. This is also showed that India has been a significant trade partner for Qatar since the blockade. Lastly, Turkey's export to Qatar reached nearly 1.1 billion US dollar in 2018. Annual increase rate of 7% was observed when it is compared to 2017, while it was around um, for, uh, 50% in 2017. In addition to the trend, I can say that Turkey has a privileged position for Qatar as being a strategic partner uh, in both political and economics. Um, in this case, in terms of meeting the needs of the forthcoming World Cup 2022 and other Qatar's infrastructure projects. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, Qatar has established a production plan where they will meet their daily needs. Although Qatar imported these products from uh, the new trade partners during the first stage of the embargo, they started to produce their products from these and other production plants. This is actually a very significant progress for Qatar. <clears throat> Before the blockade, they did, they did not need to produce these products because they were importing them from Saudi Arabia from only one hour away by, by a car. However, with this crisis, Qatar started to produce to meet a, their daily needs. As you can see in the picture, there's a Balatna. The Balatna is Qatar's largest daily production site in a visit of mine to Balat Balatna, one executive thought that thanks to this crisis, we learned that we could be self-sufficient and this difficult process pushed us into the production. As we can understand from this statement, Qatar's policies on economic diversification started to be implemented even faster with this crisis. And lastly, Qatar's foreign liquidity and private sector, uh, lastly, Qatar's foreign liquidity and private sector deposit had declined by 40 billion US dollar. It's a huge amount of uh, liquid actually. However, this loss was injected by, a, by the uh, central bank and the Qatar investment authority in a very, very early stage of the blockade. Qatar Investment Authority is the Qatar sovereign wealth funds with around 320 billion US, uh, it's not a million, it is a billion uh, US dollar wealth in 2020. However, Qatar's overseas stakes has reduced because these stakes were diverted to cash in order to meet domestic needs during the blockade. Therefore, it is easy to set it is easy to state that sovereign wealth funds help Qatar during these emergency conditions. 
Well, um, as a conclusion, I can conclude that firstly, Qatar had faced some problems in meeting its daily needs, but thanks to their new trade partners, Qatar solved this problem in the early days of the blockade. Secondly, Qatar started to produce local products to meet domestic needs. It is also good progress for their economic diversification as part of their national economic vision. Lastly, Qatar has successfully injected the money through their financial surplus and sovereign wealth funds that has been going on for years with having LNG priority into the system. And this is the end of my presentation and thank you very much for your listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Irhan, for your insightful uh, presentation about the Qatari crisis. And uh, of course, we also have to mention that this, the main reason of this blockade is uh, stemmed out of the uh, ability of Qatar to project its power. How the, the, the small country in terms of uh, population and land mass uh, uh, managed to uh, change the whole regional system to erupt revolutions, to have a satellite that can uh, topple a lot of dictatorship around the Arab world. That's why this, uh, you, we can say that this is the main uh, uh, reason for uh, this uh, blockade against Qatar. And also, uh, as uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Uh, Irhan, also the Sovereignty Wealth Fund of Qatar is one of the biggest in the world. It's, it's like it's 14, ranking the 14th on the world. That's why this is very important uh, tool of also for uh, foreign uh, foreign policy of the uh, Qatar state. Uh, so now, thank you very much. And uh, now we can move uh, into the second uh, presentation. Dr. Mohammed, yeah. Inga, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Inga uh, Ines Aragiz, I'm sorry for the, if I can pronounce the name rightly. Uh, she's a research assistant in Elia State University in Tbilisi. She will uh, speak about the Saudi-Iranian uh, competition for the regional dominance in the Middle East. Uh, please uh, proceed. Uh, yes. Uh, hello again. And uh, I would like to express uh, my thankful. It's really a ple pleasure to be this evening to be here and to participate in this uh, conference. As Dr. Mohammed already said, my paper, my presentation is about the Saudi-Iranian competition for the regional dominance in the Middle East, and this is a part of my PhD thesis. So, uh, in my research, I try to explain how this competition between the key regional players, Saudi Arabia and Iran, had affected many political and security developments in the Middle East. And in today's presentation, uh, I'm going to divide my presentation in three main parts. In first part, I will review the brief history of this competition, when and how and why it started. Uh, what are the main drivers and reasons that causes this trained relations? In the second part uh, of my presentation, I will talk about the theoretical framework of this rivalry and also discuss uh, about the form in what form this confrontation is reflected and what mechanisms are um, used uh, by the rivals. And in the um, last, in the third part, I will give some particular examples because discussing the uh, concrete crisis in this context of the Saudi-Iranian confrontation for regional dominance helps to find the answer on the question how the Saudi-Iranian competition for dominance affect other countries uh, and what are the results of these intentional actions. So let's start. Uh, competition for the regional dominance between Saudi Arabia and Iran is considered as one of the main factor of the current geopolitical changes and security challenges in the Middle East. So many scholars believe that regional uh, rivalry between Tehran and Riyadh began, uh, started after the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, and uh, I also share this opinion. Also, some scholars consider that even the Gulf Cooperation Council, so called GCC, created to weaken Iranian influence in the region uh, by united efforts. Uh, confrontation between the Saudi Arabia and Iran has a decade-long history. 
The disagreement is generally caused by the differences in sectarian, so called the Sunni and Shia relationships, and also the differences in political and ideological points of view. Both regimes question legitimacy of each other and accuse each other that they are destabilizing uh, the regional security. I will just give some examples from both sides. For example, the religious establishment in Saudi Arabia do not recognize the Shia believers as the real Muslims. And uh, some Sunni scholars in the kingdom condemn Shiism, describing some its tradition as, uh, uh, polyth like a polytheism and the Shia Muslim as social anomaly. For its turn, uh, Iran's ruling regime does not recognize the kingdom's royal family and its right to govern the Muslim country. Uh, because according to uh, Shia religious cycles, monarchy as a government system opposes the Islam and its principles. And additionally, Iran openly accused Iran for its cooperation with infidels, I mean, unbelievers, like, uh, unbelievers, like in America and Israel, uh, because of its cooperation with them in their operation against the Muslims, but mainly in Palestine and Lebanon. However, beside these two uh, main points, like the confession and also the political ideology differences, the real motive of Saudi Arabian historical confrontation relates to the competition for the leadership in the Middle East. Their dominance over this region was changing due to various historical conditions and developments. Uh, and just to also the past, a small uh, historical um, review. Uh, when the US uh, ally Shah's uh, regime was thrown by the Islamic Revolution in 1979 in Iran, Saudi Arabia uh, became concerned that the new regime would compete the kingdom as the uh, Islamic leader in the Middle East and especially in the Gulf region. Historically, Saudi Arabia portrayed it itself as the leader of the Muslim world, like it played like a role of the Vatican of the region. However, the um, above mentioned changes, uh, the kingdom were challenged by a new theocratic state um, in the face of Iran. And new Iran also posed a threat for Saudi Arabia due to potential um, Persian expansionism and Shia regime's ambition to become an alternative hegemony in, the, in terms of ideology in the region. And since the uh, 1980s, Saudi Arabia intensively invested to draw uh, Iran as a serious threat for the regional security. The common narrative was that Iran is an aggressor and one of the main uh, threats for the kingdom and the entire region. And we see that this narrative continues until nowadays, because several days ago, there was a um, statement from the king of the Saudi Arabia with the same narrative that the world must stand together uh, against the Iran. Uh, to go on. Uh, the Iran-Iraq war uh, in 1980s uh, was one of the clearest examples of the struggle for power balance in the region after the Islamic Revolution. However, Saudi Arabia and Iran became the dominant players and the um, uh, competitors in the Gulf after 2003, when Saddam Hussein's regime was overthrown and the uh, threat from Iran as a potential challenger for Saudi Arabia has rise. And since then, both countries try to underline its rival's position in the region by confronting it, each other with different cases. And uh, now uh, uh, I will uh, uh, switch to the second part of my presentation. And to review this confrontation, I have chosen the theory of balance of power as a theoretical framework. Uh, according to this theory, states seek to maintain their primacy by preventing strength of its rival. The theory suggests that in some cases, building alliances or weakening others' partnership is the main tool to uh, enhance the power, your own power. So the important uh, feature of the Saudi-Iranian confrontation is that they never confront uh, directly against each other, but uh, they are always engaged in different proxy war across the region by supporting some rebel sites or militias. 
In cases of different countries, both of them, I mean, Tehran and Riyadh, use various mechanisms to achieve the same goals, which is strengthening their own power and position by weakening the rival's influence. And their involvement in proxy wars, for example, in Syria or Yemen, uh, are the evidence of this suggestion opinion. And uh, besides this mentioned tools, which is, I mean, the hard power, Tehran and Riyadh, in some cases, also use um, other tools, other, other mechanisms, which is uh, includes the political measures, soft power, or uh, financial coercion. And uh, to see how the above mentioned is applied in the practice, uh, uh, I uh, will introduce some particular cases as the examples. And um, uh, for this presentation, uh, I choose to discuss the cases of the civil war in Syria, to mention the civil war in Syria, the case of Bahrain, also Iraq, Yemen, and of course, at Qatar. Uh, which considers the latest example in this confrontation. And uh, by this, uh, I will uh, go on, uh, switch to the uh, third part, as I said, uh, to discuss each of these uh, examples very shortly. So, as I said, the first example we can uh, discuss uh, in the context of Saudi Arabia and Iranian confrontation is the Syria. Uh, since the beginning of civil war in Syria in uh, 2011, uh, when the Arabic Spring started, Iran was the first and the most strongest supporter of ruling uh, Alawite family. Uh, it can be said that Tehran provided all kinds of support to Bashar al-Assad. I mean, it was military support and the hard power, also the political and material support. While in the same time, from the very beginning of the uprising, Saudi Arabia starts, supported the opposition groups to topple Iran's main ally, Bashar al-Assad. And uh, it su it support, uh, uh, this support, he claimed, was uh, mm, explained by the desire to help ordinary Syrian people who wanted just a change. But when it comes to Bahrain, where, uh, mm, where at that time was uh, almost the same situation in during the Arab Spring, Saudi Arabia prefers to uh, support ruling regime and not ordinary people. And uh, everyone knows why, because there the situation was different, because the ruling family was a Sunni and the um, uh, uh, demonstrators were the Shias. Uh, and uh, the Saudi Kingdom, uh, in Bahrain, there were the ruling Al Khalifa family, which is the ally of the kingdom, and the Saudi did not want any change in the status quo. And also, should be mentioned that every time in every uprising and unrest happening in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia is blaming Iran, which, according to these accusations, supports the country's Shia majority. Another example uh, from this angle is the case of Yemen which is considered as another new battlefield of uh, Saudi-Iranian proxy war. At this turn, Iran started providing support for the Houthi, Houthi movement during the uprising in 2015 uh, in an effort to change Saudi-allied Abdul Assad's uh, government. Later on, also um, Iran's political and military assistance to Houthis were also obvious in their fight against Saudi-led coalition. And it can be said that they succeeded because they changed the power balance in Yemen and created direct threat uh, on the southern border of the Saudi Arabia and dragged the monarchy into the war which, uh, with the doom uh, ending. Uh, like uh, in Yemen, Saudi Arabia also lost its final uh, advantage in Iraq after the change of the regime, as I said uh, uh, previously I mean, above. Uh, when in 2003, Saddam Hussein's regime uh, has changed, it was the throne, and the influence of Shia Iran started to rise. Over the years, uh, Iran created the secured leverages in Iraq by its proxy forces on the ground and also its allies in political uh, society and blocs in Iraq. During the last years, we saw that Saudi Arabia tried to rebuild its relations with Iraq 
For example, in 2015, it restored diplomatic relations with Baghdad. Uh, also, the last year, it's opened the consulate uh, in the capital of Iraq and announcing their willingness to uh, develop, a, uh, develop cooperation with Iraq in many different fields. But all the time, Iran and its position and influence in Iraq uh, remain the main obstacle for Riyadh uh, in this purpose. But uh, there, we can say that um, since the pro, more pro-Western candidate, uh, Mohammad al-Khazimi was appointed as the prime minister of Iraq, the situation may change in this prospect, who knows? And the last and but not least example uh, um, is the case of Qatar, the blockade of Qatar. Uh, diplomatic crisis of 2017 I mean, represents the most recent case in the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. And uh, in this case, I should mention one very important note that maybe I know that uh, Iran was not the only and decisive causing factor of this crisis, but it was one of them. So I'm discussing the case of Qatar just because, just from the Saudi Arabian confrontation prospect angle. That's why I put this example also in this presentation. Uh, over the years, Qatar's uh, independent politics, in particular uh, regarding the Muslim Brotherhoods and also the Iran and the Turkey, were irritating the Saudi Arabia as a GCC leader country. Uh, unlike, for example, Bahrain, uh, another small GCC member, uh, thanks uh, to its wealthy energy resources and also the Al Jazeera media network, Qatar was able to conduct more effective foreign policy and to influence Qatar uh, political direction Saudi Arabia several times withdraw its ambassador. It also forced Doha to cut diplomatic relations with Tehran unilaterally. And because of um, uh, Qatar-Iranian relationship was seen by Saudi Arabia as a threat for its dominance in the region and prompted the kingdom to continue its effort to prevent this relationship between Qatar and Iran. So uh, as uh, it was already mentioned also in previous presentation on June 5th of June in 2017, so-called the Quartet, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt announced that they cut diplomatic and trade ties with Qatar, claiming it supported terrorism. terrorism. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been counting on the uh, U.S. anti-Iranian policy stance for that time. However, Riyadh's hopes were overestimated because Qatar, with its close connection with the potential establishment with the U.S., uh, managed to assure Washington in its allies, and uh, after securing its partnership with the U.S., Qatar refused to fulfill any of the, uh, of the preconditions set by uh, the Saudi Arabia, including the cutting ties with Iran to end the blockade. Furthermore, uh, Doha started improving its relations with Iran. Uh, because uh, after the start of crisis, Iran expressed its political support to the Emir of Qatar, uh, and uh, also the president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, condemned the decision of the Arab countries. Uh, and also in August in the same year, Qatar restored its diplomatic relations with Iran and decided to return its ambassador to Tehran. Uh, uh, and in a, another factor, very important factor, was, uh, was the economy. Uh, because uh, uh, the economic relationship between Qatar and Iran has um, uh, developed uh, developed after the crisis for the short period, and I will say why. Um, uh, because the uh, initial shock of the blockade was that the case of food security. This also was mentioned in previous uh, presentation. As Qatar was very heavily dependent on the food import, so the kingdom's decision to close uh, Qatar's the only land border disrupted Qatar's food supply. So, and uh, Iran, alongside the Turkey, was the first uh, who immediately started sending the food and the water to Qatar and helped to solve this shortage of the supplies. And uh, also for further uh, simulation of the trade between the countries, the Iranian Qatar Chamber of Commerce were also established, established in the next year, in February of the next year. But uh, unfortunately, um, 
So further expansion of the trade uh, turnover with Qatar was not so high uh, as Iran hoped, but it has other, uh, uh, the reason was uh, other and it was just a US policy. Um, uh, but um, about also the, under the new administration of the US, the tendency may change. And in this case can be seen the situation may change in favor of the Iran. So the future will um, show. Uh, to sum up, in general, the results suggest that a decades-long standoff between Saudi Arabia and Iran still continues, and the uh, competition for regional influence uh, is uh, reflecting many countries in the Middle East. And uh, the current regional developments indicates that the Saudi-Iranian confrontation for the regional influence unfortunately will continue. So okay, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Elja. Have you finished your presentation yet? Yes, this is my presentation. In any question, regarding any question, so I'm happy to answer it at the end of the panel. Thank you very much for your in-depth analyzation of these uh, two major geopolitical players in the, in the, in the Gulf. Uh, yeah, I mean, name it Arabian Gulf, name it Persian Gulf. Uh, still, uh, you know, now uh, the two countries are now ready for the, the day after the depletion of oil, because you know that uh, Saudi Arabia is also ready for the, uh, the depletion of oil in the region, uh, also uh, Iran. Uh, has a very uh, big landmass troops uh, and uh, has the abil ability to instigate the Shiite minority in the eastern provinces in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. So even uh, now you, we know that also the United States, also the fifth uh, fleet in the region also will not stay there forever. That's why the Saudi Arabia is trying to be ready for the day after the depletion of oil. Uh, they are afraid of post the the big size army of the Iran, uh, Iran regime, and also the ideology. Now, uh, after Mohammed bin Salman uh, will come to the power, and now he's like the most influenced uh, person in Saudi Arabia, he now also tried to dismantle the Salafi ideology of the Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia will be uh, a state minus ideology, min minus uh, uh, military capability. That's why uh, this, the Saudi dilemma, uh, now, uh, they are very much afraid of uh, also the two models in the region. The uh, political model of Iranian regime, that is a revolutionary uh, uh, regime, and also from the political Islam, democratic Islam of Turkey. That's why now Saudi Arabia is doing its um, uh, all efforts in order to uh, demonize all the, 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 the Turkish uh, state and also Iranian. So we are uh, running out short of time. So. Uh, Mugina, Mugina, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Enja, for your uh, presentation. You. I'm going to the third uh, presentation uh, for uh, this session. Uh, uh, please, uh, Dr. Aisha Noor uh, Aigul, uh, she is a master's student and also Middle East Technical University. She will speak about the role of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates in the Yemeni civil war. Please proceed. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, by the way, I'm not a doctor yet. Uh, I'm just a PhD student. Uh, and I have a, a presentation. Just let me show that. Can you see my presentation now? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, please. Because I'm not sure I can show that or not. You can see, right? Yes, I can see you. I think also. No, I mean my presentation. Can you see my no, presentation? No. Mr. Berkan, can you make her presentation ready? Uh, yes, actually it's ready, but... Okay, you can, sp you can start until we just show it on the screen. Okay, uh, today I will talk about um, the role of Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates in the Yemeni civil war. And um, actually I couldn't uh, share my presentation. Anyway, I can continue like that. First of all, I want to talk about the uh, Yemen 
Ukraine civil war and the uh, evolution of the war. Um, as we know, the Arab uprisings start in uh, Tunisia, uh, split all Middle East, uh, and Yemen was one of them. And in February 2011, uh, Yemen had a um, demonstration, and following that, um, there was a, a power vacuum uh, because Salih regime uh, was gone, and um, his vice president um, Adi became uh, as a president. Uh, but actually, he couldn't uh, manage uh, the rural country uh, very well, and there was a power vacuum. In this power vacuum, uh, many powers like Houthis, uh, Al Qaeda, uh, and other uh, many small groups uh, started to have um, some territories. And in September 2014, uh, the Houthis take military control of Sana'a. Uh, and um, it was the first sign of the war. Actually, uh, in the literature, some scholars argue that um, it was the beginning of the war. Uh, actually, I also prefer that, but I have to emphasize that um, the Yemeni civil war didn't uh, start exactly at that time. Uh, as I said, the power vacuum uh, since uh, 2011 was uh, the major reason in this point. And in 2015, there was a uh, Saudi-led uh, coalition and its uh, intervention in the war. Uh, actually, it came after the um, Hadi's uh, request. Uh, Hadi uh, asked their help and Saudi Arabia replied that quickly. Um, and the other turning point in the war uh, in December 2017, at that time, Ayla Abdullah Saleh was killed by Houthis. Actually, they were uh, like uh, allies uh, till that time against uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but um, when uh, Ayla Abdullah Saleh uh, started to change his mind uh, against Saudi Arabia, Houthis uh, targeted him and they killed him. Uh, and December 2018, another turning point uh, in the war, uh, since um, Stockholm Agreement was signed, uh, it was uh, actually um, a real uh, achievement, but um, it didn't leave that much. Uh, another turning point of in the summer of uh, 2019, because uh, United Arab Emirates decided to leave uh, his, uh, her troops from Yemen. Actually, um, or officially, uh, they uh, left, uh, but still they are supporting some groups. Uh, we will talk about that more. And November 2019, uh, Riyadh Agreement was signed between STC Southern uh, Trans Transition Council and uh, Hadi government. So, um, what was the main causes of the war? Uh, the long years political, social, and economic uh, unrest uh, and mar uh, marginalization of Houthis and Southern people. What I mean is that uh, since um, the first war, uh, when I said first war, I mean the 1962 and uh, 1970 war between uh, royalists and um, republicans. The war uh, between, since the, uh, that war, uh, Houthis uh, became uh, marginalized by the governments. And uh, after the um, unification of uh, two Yemen, uh, North and South, uh, southern people also are marginalized by the governments. And um, the other um, causes, main causes, was a uh, six rounds war uh, between Houthis and uh, Salih government. Uh, it uh, continued to, uh, from 2004 to uh, 2010. In this war, um, Saudi Arabia in 2009 uh, intervened the war when Houthis um, targeted their territories. But it's not the uh, uh, same um, like this war. And 2007, Al Hirak uh, was um, established. Al Hirak was a southern um, secessionist uh, group, but at that time they didn't um, intend to um, establish a, a, a southern uh, state at that time. Uh, and there was a southern uh, people's demonstration in 2008 and 9. And uh, 2011 Arab uprising. All these uh, paved the way for the uh, current war. And what was the main internal actors in the war? Uh, the main internal actors, as all we know, the Houthis, uh, they are backed by Iran, uh, Hadi government. Uh, it is internationally uh, recognized government. Uh, United Nations uh, recognized this government. And it is backed by the Saudi uh, led coalition and STC, Southern Transil uh, uh, Council. It's backed by uh, United Arab Emirates and um, it is aiming uh, a divided 
and uh, separate southern Yemen, like in the uh, 1990s, and uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and the Yemeni uh, Islamic State, and the Islah and Salafis. Uh, actually, Islah and Salafis is not that much uh, strong uh, like the others, but it is important to mention their names here. Uh, external regional actors, um, Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates are the primary actors, but uh, inside the coalition there were Qatar and Morocco, but they uh, left the coalition, and still there are Egypt, J Jordan, Sudan, Kuwait, Bahrain and Israel. So uh, now we will talk about uh, my main issue, the uh, role of Saudi Arabia and United em Arab Emirates. In this point, we have to uh, divide uh, the role between uh, motivations and uh, extent of the intervention. So uh, first, I will talk about the motivations of Saudi Arabia. First of all, the kingdom's foreign policy. There was a permanent and temporary element in uh, Saudi foreign policy. Uh, in the uh, temporary elements, we can say that uh, Saudi foreign policy are evaluated from quite diplomatic militarization. What I mean is that uh, before the Arab uprisings, uh, Saudi Arabia was following a quiet diplomacy. Uh, so he was uh, giving money to any states if he she wants to support. But after uh, Arab uprisings, it changed and Saudi Arabia started to use its uh, military. Uh, the first example was Bahrain intervention. Uh, as we know, uh, Bahrain demonstration was suppressed by uh, Saudi Arabia, its troops. Uh, and the other uh, main um, example are Yemen. Uh, and still, um, in 2011, Saudi Arabia sent uh, some troops uh, under uh, UN uh, to Libya. The permanent element of Saudi uh, foreign policy was a regime and state survival. Uh, survival. Since the establishment of the government of uh, kingdom, regime and state survival are the main um, point of the Saudi foreign policy. Uh, Saudi foreign policy tried to uh, secure its regime and uh, state. What uh, that means? Uh, that means is that um, if there is um, any um, challenge from regional uh, point, uh, it can uh, spill um, over the country and it can affect uh, Saudi regime because there are some uh, opponent groups like uh, Shias in the Al Afsa uh, or other some uh, groups. Uh, they are challenging the Saudi government from time to time. So uh, the regional status quo are important in order to um, keep the uh, domestic status quo. So Yemen was considered in that point, if there's uh, anything wrong in Yemen, it can spill over to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia uh, feel that uh, she has to uh, suppress that. Uh, and strate strategic importance of Yemen. Uh, Yemen uh, is located um, Gulf of Aden, Red Sea, between Gulf of Aden, Red Sea and Bab el -Mandab. So uh, these all uh, are important uh, for uh, not only for Yemen, for regional politics, also international politics, because there are oil transition uh, from there and um, the Bab el-Mandeb was the only way to go to Red Sea. So uh, strategic location of Yemen was matter at that point and Saudi Arabia uh, didn't want to give any other power to uh, have an influence there. Uh, and uh, status uh, struggle, uh, this uh, term, this uh, concept was um, improved by May Darch. Uh, she argues that status struggle uh, means um, that Saudi Arabia um, wants to show the other regional power is that uh, she is like uh, elder uh, brother and uh, she was the hegemonic power, especially in the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, in this context, uh, Saudi Arabia has to show its power. Um, in, uh, there are some uh, events uh, Saudi Arabia was triggered uh, by them, especially in uh, Oman and Kuwait and Qatar's um, stance ex uh, affects Saudi Arabia. In 2013, uh, Oman and Kuwait rejected the Saudi uh, offer to, uh, to make uh, um, GCC deeper. After that, um, Oman also hosts uh, United States and Iran to make a agreements uh, over a nuclear issue. And finally, um, as um, 
other speakers mentioned, Qatar uh, Bilokaj. Uh, Qatar was seen as a threat um, uh, from Saudi Arabia. That's why uh, Saudi Arabia wanted to show uh, that um, she was the regional hegemonic power, uh, especially in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. That's why uh, Yemen was a good chance for Saudi Arabia to show its um, power. Uh, and rivalry with Iran, um, as the speaker uh, before then me uh, mentioned about that, it affects regional politics and also Saudi uh, foreign policy. Um, in order to um, in order to keep its uh, its interest in the region, uh, Saudi Arabia has to feel that uh, she has to challenge with Iran and she uh, has to um, keep its power. That's why. Um, she um, was uh, trying to uh, block uh, Iranian power in uh, Yemen and uh, Iran's support in other countries was uh, its uh, other example and Saudi Arabia felt that um, Iran is really a threat and it's not uh, just imaginary uh, because we can see that in, uh, with um, Hamas, Hezbollah, Shabi and Syria. Uh, so uh, we have to take care of uh, Iranian threat in Yemen uh, and Yemen is uh, too near a territory to Saudi Arabia. So um, Saudi Arabia um, attempted to intervene in the war. And domestic policy, uh, policies, um, after Mohammed bin Salman, uh, anti-Iran uh, rhetoric was increased in Saudi Arabia, and uh, especially in 2017, the events uh, inside the kingdom affect uh, this uh, a lot, because Mohammed bin Salman was uh, marginalized some um, other princes from the kingdom, and uh, he was trying to be the only leader, uh, which can affect uh, both uh, domestic and foreign policy. So uh, Mohammed bin Salman, in order to keep its uh, power, um, increased anti-Iran uh, rhetoric and used uh, Yemen in this point. And Saudi perception on Houthis, Houthis um, was, uh, was seen by Saudi Arabia as a Hezbollah-like entity. So uh, Saudi Arabia didn't want uh, a kind of Hezbollah-like entity in it, uh, near to its border. So what was uh, Saudi Arabia uh, doing uh, in the war? First of all, it's uh, developing close uh, ties with different parties. Uh, what I mean is that Saudi Arabia didn't uh, support only Hadi government. She was also supporting Islah and um, some other uh, groups. Especially Islah is important because uh, it's like a Muslim Brotherhood uh, of Yemen. Uh, so we will talk about that more, but it's important. And uh, Saudi Arabia was, uh, uh, is finding, training and equipping groups, soldiers and militias. Also providing uh, funds for governance and services and providing diplomatic support for Hadi government especially. And it's a uh, direct military intervention, uh, as you know, air streaks and sending ground troops. Uh, also a uh, blockage on sea, land and air routes, air routes and um, humanitarian aids. Uh, humanitarian aid, actually, it's, in this point, it seems strange, but um, Saudi Arabia was helping and establishing um, hospitals and giving medical support to Yemen. Uh, so Saudi Arabia uh, supported uh, Hadi and uh, Islah. Uh, the leader of Islah is Ali Mursi, and um, he was a, a prominent leader and uh, it's uh, like Muslim Brotherhood uh, leader in the Yemen. Uh, and this point, uh, as I said, important because it shows a multipolarity of the regional uh, Politics. What I mean is that um, when Saudi Arabia supports uh, ISLA, uh, it is uh, strange because uh, in uh, general the regional politics, Saudi Arabia um, feeling challenged from the Muslim Brotherhood and trying to suppress uh, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt or in another country. But in Yemen, uh, she is supporting ISLA. So why she is doing that? Uh, the point is that uh, she is trying to support all status quo power in Yemen uh, because uh, uh, ISLA uh, are um, collaborating with Hadi governments uh, from time to time and they are trying to uh, save the status quo of the uh, country and uh, that's what um, Saudi Arabia wants. And the other uh, ma major, uh, major re regional actor are uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, as we did in the Saudi Arabia, uh, again I will talk about motivations and its interventions. Motivations, 